Good morning. Will you turn your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew chapter 26. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 26. It's certainly great to see each of you here this morning. We know it was a little wet coming in, but we're thankful that you made it safely and we're hoping that anyone else that may be on their way will also arrive safely as well. Well, those of you that have been around the last week or so know that our Vacation Bible School was a wonderful success. Scott Kaiser at the end of the service will tell you more about uh, some of those items, but uh, there was all kinds of cool things happening this past week. It was certainly a blue ribbon life as we studied the fruit of the Spirit. I know there's going to be many memorable items, and I'm sure each of you have your own list, but uh, the, the Ferris wheel has got to be one of the items I'm sure that, that most of us will remember as far as one of the, the great things about Vacation Bible School. I asked Braden on the way over to church, I said, Braden, what was your favorite part of, of Vacation Bible School? And, and, and he said, the resurrection. And I said, the resurrection? Okay, so why was that? And he said, well, we had this donut with, with an Oreo, and I was able to eat the entire resurrection scene. He didn't say it exactly that way, but that's pretty much uh, what he uh, remembered. And we know that the activities and the crafts and the those items were a big success. Also on my short list of memories is, I think, Scott leading the song, I've Got Peace Like a River, and, and, and having all of, of those uh, motions that, that go along with it. And then, of course, an item that uh, capped us off each night was our uh, booster, booster, be a booster. Don't be grouchy like a rooster. Boost our Bible school. And we know that our, our vacation Bible school in, in 2013 was boosted with your attendance and, and with your participation and with your love and service and dedication to the Lord. Our numbers were strong all week. We started off with 170, most of those having to do with children. 146, 153, 170. And the, the fifth night, I'm not exactly sure, the rain may have made us gone down a little bit, but, but a large majority of our attendance was our, our children. I, I think in uh, one of the nights, in the K through first grade class, there was 13 kiddos uh, in that class. And I, I think the, even the teenagers, grade 7 through 12, capped off at, at 23 uh, for one of those uh, nights. It, it was certainly a, a great night. The word rooster only appears one in one account throughout Scripture. Now it appears several times, actually the same account four times in each of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And of course this account that we'll consider this morning as we open up has to do with the denial of Jesus Christ by the Apostle Peter. I'm in Matthew chapter 26 beginning in verse number 31. Then Jesus said to them, this is right after instituting the Lord's Supper and right after singing that song on the Mount of Olives, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to them, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you that this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the 
disciples. So we certainly don't want to pick on the Apostle Peter, but he is the one that this text uh, uh, focuses on. And the end of verse uh, 35, so said all the disciples. He certainly wasn't alone, but it's the Apostle Peter that we typically think of that had a, a weak moment. Now, he at, the, at that particular moment, as Jesus is saying some things that are about to happen, there was the Apostle Peter that I, I think we can all identify with. We've all had those moments of faith in which we have said, Lord, I will never commit this sin again. It's pretty good. It's a pretty good idea never to use the word never and to never use the word always. But it was Peter that he was feeling good. He was feeling confident in the Lord. And he says, Lord, I will never stumble before you. We all know what it's like to make promises to God. And it's not that we don't have bad and it's not that we don't have good intentions. But we, I think, can certainly identify with Peter that, that we had, we were living strong. And we may be at worship on a Sunday morning after a rough weekend. Or, or we may be back in church after being gone for several weeks or even months. And we make the statement, Lord, I will never enter into that way of life again. Lord, I am thankful for the opportunity to be here. And we certainly do not want to discredit the statement of faith that Peter was making at that moment. But as we know from the text and as we know in our own lives, that those strong moments of faith can very quickly turn in a negative direction depending on what is happening. Verse number 69 of Matthew 26. Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. This is the same Peter that just said, I will never stumble before you, and I will always, and I will never deny you. I want to even die with you, Jesus. But that same Peter, who once experienced a strong moment of faith, was now entering in a weak time in which he was denying, possibly even a bit ashamed, for his association with Jesus. Verse 71, And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, Peter denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while, those who stood by came to him and said to Peter, Surely you also were one of them, because your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Then he went out and wept bitterly. There are all kinds of forces and factors around us that are resulting in men and women denying the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We live in a culture that, in a sense, uh, it, it, it facilitates atheism. We, we live in a society, at least from a, a media perspective or from an entertainment industry, that the Christians are the, the bad folks, the Christians are the uncool, the silly ones, but it, it's the atheists, it's the non-Christians, those are the pretty ones. Those are the cool ones. Those are the ones that, that seem to be happy in life, at least from a, a, a media perspective. We also know that there's forces uh, as far as uh, denying uh, Jesus. And uh, we know that the, the people that we tend to associate with outside of church 
can have an impact on us. The crowd that we hang around with on Sunday mornings at church, that may be a completely different crowd that we associate with on Friday and Saturday nights or or, or the types of folks that we associate with during the weekend. And when we're around those types of crowds, it, it, it may be one thing where we can be more likely to deny our Savior. And I'm also mindful of, of, our, of our young folks who are out of school and, and in, in, in summertime. And, and I know it's a great feeling to not have to wake up and go to school every morning. And we're very thankful for your participation and your involvement in church and VBS. And you may have moments of strong faith then. But what happens during the summer times when you wake up and you realize your parents are at work and, and there's no one else at church that's seeing what you're doing? Are you in a position where you are going to deny your faith and do some things that are contrary to God's Word? It's a very sad account here in Matthew 26. G- Peter was very uh, adamant about his lack of faith or his denial. But then very quickly, as verse number 75 says, when that rooster crowed, it was the aha moment. It was a back into reality setting. It was when Peter realized that he had really messed up. And like so many of us have gone through that cycle of of having strong moments of faith and then having weak moments of faith in which we deny our Lord, Peter was back in reality. And he was very upset with how he conducted himself. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now those of us familiar with the biblical text know that the legacy of the the Apostle Peter does not stop here after he denied Jesus three times. And in fact, it seems like this one event may have just facilitated a life of faithfulness in the life of Peter. Now we're certainly not saying to leave church this morning and go out, deny Jesus three times and then and come back and you'll be ready to live a life of enormous faith. But it is the understanding that sometimes as we reflect on our mistakes and our poor decisions, we realize that we really did mess up and we never want to do that again. But the Apostle Peter, he, he utilized this event and he looked at it, it was a negative one, but I'm sure he was able to focus and think back on that and, re- and look at it from a different perspective. He may have looked back at that event and say, I never want to do that again. He may have even used some eternal language there. But the legacy of the Apostle Peter, even though he was not perfect after this denial of Jesus three times, he was the man who preached to the Jews on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. He was the man who preached throughout many regions, including the Gentiles in the house of Cornelius. And it was the Apostle Peter that that wrote those two letters inspired by the Holy Spirit, the ones that bear his name, 1st and 2nd Peter. This morning, as we are considering the life of the Apostle Peter, and, and as our sermon is entitled, Let's Boost Our Faith, I'd like to take you on a brief tour this morning in the book of Acts as far as some events in the life of Peter in which he was boosting his faith, and ones in which he was not denying Jesus Christ, but he was living for him. And I'm hoping that as we notice what Peter was doing well, that it will also be an encouragement and a motivation for us to boost our faith as well. We're going to go slightly out of order, but we'll be in Acts 4, Acts 10, and then we'll come back to Acts 2 a little while later. But if you would, turn to the book of Acts, chapter 4. And as we make these five observations, we're going to use the word boost, B-O-O-S-T, to help follow our thoughts. And if you have a sermon outline in your bulletin, then that may be helpful to you as well. 
We're not going to read all of the verses associated with these texts, but I'd like to highlight a verse or two out of each of them. Acts chapter 4 is a scenario in which uh, Peter and John, they, are, they have been arrested. Uh, they, they, they're getting in all kinds of trouble, not because of what they've doing, they're doing wrong, but because of what they're doing right. And that is they are preaching and teaching the gospel. They, they get arrested in, in, in the beginning of chapter 4, and then uh, Peter is doing some more preaching to the, the Sanhedrin. Those were the, the big timers uh, of of political and religious influence uh, in the first century um, of the Jews. And uh, verse number 8 of Acts 4. As first of all, we're noticing that as Christians, we need, in order to boost our faith, we need to be bold. Verse number 8 of Acts chapter 4. Peter, being filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people... And elders of Israel, it must have been a a, a strong moment, a, a moment of courage, a, mo- a moment of boldness for Peter to, to talk to important people, to these rulers, to these ones that had influence, these ones that have ability and power to throw him into prison or even end his life. And so he stands up and he's addressing the rulers of the people and the elders of Israel. And he's teaching them about Jesus Christ, particularly in verse number 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. In verse number 13, the text says, Now when they saw... The boldness of Peter and John. They were perceived that they were uneducated and untrained, but they marveled. And they realized that they, notice the end of verse 13, had been with Jesus. For those of us that have been with Jesus, not in the sense of living in the first century, but those of us that are walking in the light, those of us that have been baptized into Christ in which we come into contact with the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ, we know what it's like to be with Jesus. And as a result, we can address those folks that are around us with boldness, teaching them about the fact, the reality, that there is salvation in no other except for Jesus Christ. Also, if you look in Acts chapter 10, we need to not only be bold, but as the Apostle Paul was, we also need to be obedient as well. Paul, I'm sorry, as Peter is going through and as he's preaching and preparing to go into the house of of Cornelius, which you know is the first Gentile uh, group that was receiving the gospel, Peter basically is receiving this vision. In verse number 11, there's this great sheet. It's bound with four corners. And and, uh, there's these uh, four-footed animals uh, on the earth, verse number 12. In verse 13, And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed you, must you must not call on common. This was done three times, and the heaven and the object was taken up into the heaven again. And so as Peter was trying to make sense of that vision, he ultimately, and finally in verse 21, Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? The apostle Peter was responding in obedience. The Lord gave him a command And he obeyed that command of the Lord. And as we continue on in Acts chapter 10, and and again, we're not reading the entire text, but at number three, in the same way that Peter was boosting his faith, we need to be bold and obedient. And we need to be opportunistic at the same time. We need to realize that we have 
opportunities to spread the gospel. And so Peter, in verse number 25, he's coming in, and Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet, and Peter basically says, Stand up, for I am just a man. And he said to them, verse 28, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Verse, 20, verse 29, Therefore I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Peter was boosting his faith by taking advantage of the opportunities he had to share the gospel with others. Now, none of us are being called to go into the house of Cornelius. None of us are going to see a vision with four corners, with four-legged animals or anything like that. But every single one of us have opportunities to be evangelistic, to share our faith with others. I challenge you to think about the people in your life right now that that may be asking you the questions or something to the effect of, so uh, what what kind of church do you go to? Or um, what what do you think about this? Or uh, they they may be asking the question, um, what do y'all believe about that? And, And even though the words or the language may not truly reflect or they may not be saying things exactly correct, we understand that those are people that are seeking. And if there are people in our lives that are asking us questions about our faith, about the church, about the Bible, those are opportunities. Those are golden opportunities. Because we don't have to get their attention. They've already got ours. And and we are looking for ways to answer them We'll answer those Bible questions with Bible answers. But it's so easy to shy away when the conversation shifts to something spiritual or something about faith. But if we are boosting our faith, we're going to be taking advantage of these opportunities. Back in Acts chapter 2, and we went out of order just to, uh, to make this, uh, this, use this word boost. The Apostle Peter was bold. He was obedient. He was opportunistic. And number four, he was standing for his faith. Notice Acts chapter 2, verse number 14. On the day of Pentecost, as he's opening up this sermon, but Peter... Standing up with the eleven. This is much different than that man that denied Jesus three times and and was certain and that, that Jesus was was not the, the man of God. But he was standing up with the with the eleven. He's raising his voice and said to them, Men of Judah. Also in verse twenty two, Peter is saying, Men of Judah. Israel, Verse 29, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you. And then, of course, he concludes that sermon in verse 36, saying, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter was standing up for his faith. Now, we have the opportunity to stand up for our faith all kinds of ways. We need to stand up for our faith. I know summer is here, but when we get back into school in the fall, our our students, our children, they need to stand up for what is right, knowing that God is being pushed more and more out of the schools. We need to stand up for what is right when there's issues in our society that are immoral, whether that has to do with with same-sex attraction or whether that has to do with uh, abortion. It's not about women's rights. We want women to have rights. But we want them to understand the sanctity of life as well. We need to stand up for those things that are right. And finally, in Acts chapter number 12, Peter was boosting his faith about boldness and obedience. He was taking opportunities to share his faith. He was standing for what is right. 
And fifth and finally, he was trusting in the Lord. Peter had just been released from prison in, in Acts chapter number 12, or he's in the process of, of, of those things happening. And, and notice verse number 9. So he went out and followed him. And did not know that what was done by the angel was real. But Peter thought he was seeing a vision. And when they were past the first and second guard posts that came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and went down one street, immediately the angel departed from him. In verse 11, And when Peter had come to himself... He said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. Notice in verse number 9 how uncertain Peter was. And then in verse number 11, know how, how, notice how certain he was. You see, we need to trust in the Lord during those uncertain times in our lives. And we need to trust in the Lord during the certain times in our lives. But our faith is most often tested, our trust in God is most often tested during those uncertain times. Those uncertain times when we don't know what to do. When uh, it's, it's, that, it's a new situation. It, it's a life experience we've never, exper- we've, never, it's nev- we've never experienced it before. And we do not know what to do. It's a life situation in which there is all kinds of uncertainty. And we ask the question, is there anything else I can do about this situation? When the answer is no... That's when we need to trust. Well, we need to trust before we ask that question and answer it. But when we have done every single thing possible to make a situation better and there is nothing else we can do, we can choose to live in a life of anxiety or we can choose to live in a life of trust and faith. Trust is what we do when we do not know what to do. We finish this morning in 2 Peter chapter 1. All throughout the life of Peter, after denying Jesus Christ those three times, he boosted his faith. He was bold and he was obedient. He took advantage of opportunities to spread the gospel. He was standing for the Lord and he was trusting in God during times of uncertainty and times of certainty as well. And as we come to 2 Peter 1 and as we finish this morning, and as we're wrapping all of these items together, Peter gives, in a sense, his own rendition of the fruit of the Spirit. He tells us a a way very specifically to boost our faith, to add to our faith. Verse number 5, but also for this very reason, Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's all make it a a commitment this morning to boost our faith and not just let VBS be a a one-week-a-year type mentality. 
But let it be something that carries with us each and every week and each and every day of our lives. This morning we are singing this song of invitation. We want you to know if you've never become a Christian that we do love you. More importantly, God loves you. And God has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to die, to live a perfect life and to also die on, on the cross, to be buried and to be resurrected in order for us to have the same opportunity to rise again after we are gone from this earth and to live with Him forever. Peter preaches very openly and very plainly about what to do to become a Christian. He talks about in Acts chapter 2 as he is preaching to the Jews on the day of Pentecost the importance of repenting of sins, Acts 2 verse 38. And not only repenting, but also being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins in order for those sins to be forgiven. So this morning, if you've never become a Christian, will you do so while together we stand and sing?